all stand? Number 44 in your hymn book, And Can It Be? Looking forward to singing this hymn. Let's lift it up on that first verse. Thank you, thank you for singing. Thank you for being here. And I want to give you a couple of prayer requests. I'm going to ask Brother Bob Sanders, if he doesn't mind, to come to the platforms, open us in prayer. He's a wonderful blessing, a great preacher, and we thank God for him being with us tonight. He won't remember these names, but I want to alert the church family. Continue to pray for Brother Bob Daniels. I saw him just a little bit ago, and uh, they are hoping you'll get stronger over the next day or two. Send him home increasingly, get him a little bit stronger so he can start on some chemotherapy pills and uh, then probably stay on those. So that's a good move. This is what the doctor wants to happen. And um, they, of course, it's, you know, it's a back set from where it was two weeks ago, but he's coming along. And so please pray for him. Pray for Miss Judy Whitson. She's got a lot of appointments and different things she's got to figure out. The, doctor, the doctor's going to know, but the Lord's going to give wisdom and we pray for her. And then Miss Karen Bird's up in Holston Valley. And uh, so she's um, uh, hopefully be moved into a regular room tonight. Keep her lifted up in prayer. And Brother Phil, uh, Phil Stockslager is down here at um, Johnson City Medical
Medical Center having some procedures done as well and some different things going on. Brother Dan was able to stop by and see him. So keep him in prayer. And then Miss Leslie Farmer, she's here, but it's got another treatment tomorrow. So keep her lifted up in prayer if you would. Those are just for the church family. To just remember those. And Brother Sanders won't remember those requests, but I'm going to ask him. He's a good friend of Brother Joe's as well. And um, he, he still came to hear him. <laughs> Isn't that amazing? <laughs> He knew it. He knew he was preaching. He still came. He's never come when I preach, but uh, I'm not taking offense at that. So, Brother Sanders, pray for us, please. Father, thank you for the privilege, Lord, of being in the house of the Lord tonight. And, Lord, we're thankful that uh, of all these requests, you're aware of every one of them. But, Lord, the thing that moves us most is the fact that you're touched with the feelings of our infirmities. And, Father, you're concerned about our needs tonight. Father, Lord, I come asking in behalf of Brother Joe that you would anoint him and touch him. I pray even right now that you'd bring to his mind the things that need to be said. And then, Lord, I pray the sweet Spirit of God would hover over this place and break up the foul of ground. And, Lord, may the seed of the Word of God find the fruitful soil of our heart. Lord, we love you except the praise of our lips. We love you now, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, I want you to pray for us. We lost one. <laughs> Sam is a pastor in Murfreesboro, and he had to go preach to his people tonight. But he sure enjoyed being with you, and we all have. You've made us feel so welcome. I can't thank you enough for the hotel room. We're in the Holiday Inn. You know somebody loves you when they put you in the Holiday Inn. If they don't care much for you, they put you in that no roof in or someplace like that but I'm, I'm thankful for that holiday inn then we got in there and we found a basket full of treats I mean just delicious things uh, things we love and Miss Renee fixed up that basket for us and it has been a delight and your pastor has been taking us out to eat we've gained weight there's no doubt about that we're heading home tomorrow we got to go home and go on a diet but your pastor has been so good to us Many of you have encouraged us with just kind words and compliments, and we don't need that, you know, we, uh, but it sure is appreciated very much. Thank you very much. And uh, we're going to sing a song that Jonathan wrote a few years back. He wrote this really before we had all this bombardment of bad news that we have in our country today. It seemed like an epidemic of just negative news we've got fear news we've got fake news but i thank god we got the faithful news right here this is one we need to saturate our minds with this news from heaven i sat down to catch up on the headlines they were full of violence, pain, and tragedy. Fear was in the forecast, sickness all around, fighting and dividing, turning friends to enemies. Soon my heart was heavy from the voice of gloom and doubt, so I picked up my old Bible, and this is what I found. The news report from heaven says that God's still on the throne And He's still saving souls and answering prayer He knows what tomorrow holds and what'll happen years from now He knows because He's already there Our loved ones who have gone before, well they're still doing fine The future over there is looking bright I just got a news report from heaven And found out everything will be alright Amen If you believe that, let me hear a big amen Praise God Now I don't know what trials you are facing I don't know how many tears you've cried You may think the darkness has overcome the light And each day is a struggle to survive 
Friend, don't despair, don't give up hope. Amen. Don't let life steal your joy. Right. Turn off all the doubters. Tune in to Jesus' voice. Amen. The news report from heaven says that God's still on the throne. And he's still saving souls and answering prayer. He knows what tomorrow holds and what will happen years from now. He knows because he's already there. Our loved ones who have gone before, well, they're still doing fine. The future over there is looking bright. I just got a news report from heaven and found out everything will be all right. I just got a news report from heaven and found out everything is going to be all right. <laughs> Amen. Boy, oh boy, that felt good. That felt good, singing it with the author. We sing that. My wife and I, we travel, just the two of us now. All of our kids left us. For, we've been forsaken, but uh, thank God they're all out there serving the Lord. I'm thankful for that. But my wife and I travel, and we go to mainly smaller churches, mainly. about uh, Most of them about half the size of this section right here. <laughs> really, if we get in a church that is the size of this section right here that's a big church for us but uh, we we enjoy it you know the little flocks they need uh, they need revival and they need encouragement and we sing that song everywhere we go here's another song we started singing and it's an old old song probably most of you have never heard this song i've only heard one man sing it and that was old james blackwood from the old time blackwood brothers and he sang this song. He's the only one I've ever heard. But my wife and I heard, uh, pulled it up, found it, and, uh, and relearned it. And we want to sing it for you tonight. It's kind of a testimony. My wife and I, we've been married 45 years, been traveling together now for the Lord 23 years. And uh, this song says it's been a good trip. It's been a good trip. Hadn't always been a bed of roses. <laughs> there have been some valleys. There have been some storms. But I'll tell you what, the good outweighs the bad, and it's been a good trip. It's been a good trip, and I've enjoyed traveling the King's Highway. The mountains and the valleys, the rough and the smooth, the night as well as the day. Now it hasn't always been an easy road. A lot of things have tried to make me stray, but God gives me heaven to go to heaven in, and it's been a good trip on the way. Amen. You say you're looking for a challenge in life, something to really live for. Let me tell you about a journey that starts at an altar, leads you to heaven's shore. If you got what it takes to get in the race, I guarantee you someday you'll say, I'm glad, thank God, I'm glad that I started and it's been a good trip on the way. It's been a good trip and I've enjoyed traveling the King's Highway. The mountains and the valleys, the rough and the smooth, the night as well as the day. Now it hasn't always been an easy road. A lot of things have tried to make me stray, but God gives me heaven to go to heaven in. And it's been a good trip on the way. It's gonna be a wonderful time when I finally reach that heavenly place. When the gates swing open and I walk in that city and I look on his blessed face. But all of the happiness, thrill, and joy hasn't been reserved for that day. Cause I get to feeling pretty good singing about it and it's been a good trip on the way. It's been a good trip and I've enjoyed traveling the King's Highway. The mountains and the valleys, the rough and the smooth, the night as well as the day. Now it hasn't always been an easy road. A lot of things have tried to make me stray, but God gives me heaven to go to heaven in. And it's been a good trip on the way. Yes, God gives me heaven to go to heaven in. And it's been a good trip, been a good trip, been a good trip on the way. 
Amen. Amen. If you agree with that tonight, give me a good amen. amen. If you agree with that, let me hear you say hallelujah. hallelujah. Why do we let the charismatics have all the good words? Hallelujah is a good word. It's a Bible word. Amen. Well, I told my wife and Jonathan, we practiced a little bit uh, tonight. I said, I've got a song on my heart that uh, it, this is not really a, a revival song. It's not a camp meeting song. I've never heard anybody shout on this song for sure because the name of the song is When I Came to the End of Myself. And it's a song about dying to self. And you know, my friend, that's exactly what we've got to do. <laughs> if we want the blessings of God, if we want Jesus to live his life through us, we've got to die to self. I told the story in our church not long ago about, we've sang this song, and I told about uh, Bobby Robertson. Oh, dear old brother Bobby. Was riding along in a car with Brother Lester Roloff. They were in a meeting together, and Brother Bobby uh, was kind of picking at Brother Roloff, you know, saying some funny things and joking around, and Brother Roloff got quiet. And Brother Bobby thought he'd offended him. So he said, Brother Roloff, he said, I didn't hurt you, did I? What I said a while ago, I didn't hurt your feelings. And you know, Brother Roloff looked at him and said, Brother Bobby, he said, if you hurt me, it's my fault because I'm supposed to be dead. And you can't hurt a dead man. You know, Brother John, I think that would solve every church split. I think that'd take care of it. You talk about unity in a church. Talk about harm. Talk about one mind and one accord. If we all had that attitude, if you hurt me, it's my fault. I'm supposed to be dead. The young man that was with us last night, I, I wouldn't say this if he was here, but uh, Sam Epley, our second son, he's a man of God. He pastors the church in Murfreesboro. The church is growing, and God's blessing him. And uh, he was born, all of you who shook his hand, you noticed uh, he's got a... A uh, deformed hand. He was born missing two fingers on his right hand. His right arm's about 10% smaller than his other arm. And we, we looked at that in the hospital about 3 o'clock in the morning. I, I couldn't believe my eyes. And uh, then when he was about five years old, he came down with a terrible, I don't know what you call it, some kind of a syndrome called Tourette syndrome. And Sam would make noises. His hands would fly up. He did strange things and he he made so many noises involuntary noises if you've ever known anybody that had Tourette syndrome it's a horrible thing and we took him to a neurologist and he said you know what I know what it is but he said there is no cure for Tourette syndrome now, our son suffered with that for about three years I mean on top of the arm and the hand and then he had that Tourette syndrome and I really believe during those years of his life that it brought Sam to the end of himself. And, uh, you know, he's grown up to be a man of God. And we, we're so thankful for him. So, you know, when this song says God sometimes has to bring you to high rugged mountains that you cannot climb, valleys you cannot cross, and you give up and you say, Lord, I can't do this. And that's when the Lord says, I can. I can do it if you'll just get out of the way and let me do it. But you got to die to self. Serving Jesus, but in my own power, I was doing all I knew to do. But I was not prepared for the hour When a high mountain came into view In my own strength I struggled to climb it But oh, such weakness I felt Somewhere on that mountain in darkness I came to the end of myself But when I came to the end of myself He was there to give me His help 
and I said I'm not able he said I am in my weakness I discovered the strength of the lamb his almighty power I felt when I came to the end of my now there's a secret you may be missing as you struggle to just make it through it will take more than your best to please him Jesus wants to live his life through you so he'll bring you to high rugged mountains for a lesson that you must learn well then he'll patiently wait for the moment when you come to the end of yourself and when you come to the end of yourself he was there to give you his help when you say you're not able he'll say i am in your weakness you'll discover the strength of the lamb with victory you'll say it is well when you come to the end of yourself when you come to the end of yourself Amen. And let's all stand. 393. Blessed assurance. Jesus is mine. Let's lift it up on that first verse. Blessed assurance. Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory. second grade if you would let's follow brother uh brother kyle snyder you've got some fun playing for you tonight number 56 in your hymn book before they come one more time to bless us with wonderful music let's sing this chorus his name is wonderful his name is wonderful his name is wonderful, Jesus, my Lord. He is the mighty master of everything. His name is wonderful, Jesus, my Lord. He's the great shepherd. Oh, 
Amen. We had a request. We had a man uh, request a song called He Can. And I always like it when somebody requests a song because I know at least one person will enjoy this song. And uh, so wherever that man is, uh, he's in bib overalls, but uh, wherever he is, I hope he, he gets a blessing for this. I like this song, He Can. <laughs> can speak to a cripple and he'll stand right up and walk and who can cause the deaf and dumb to hear and start to talk and who can calm a fevered brow by saying let it be take a little bit of clay and touch them in a way that blinded eyes can see oh he can and i know that he'll stand by your side when the world comes crumbling in done. He laid down his life, but he rose to live again. Amen. Now who can cause an old man who's about to say goodbye to lift up both of his dying hands with a tear running from his eye? With his loved ones gathered all around him, he can smile and say, don't fear. For the one who brought me through the storm will lead me home from here. Oh, he can, and I know that he'll stand by your side when the world comes crumbling in. life but he rose to live again i'm telling you he can and i know that he'll stand by your side when the world comes crumbling in for no one's ever done what he's done he laid down his life but he rose to live again he laid down his life but he rose to live again Praise God. All right, we'll do one more for you tonight. The pastor said do five now. We're going to do it. And uh, he's sure been good to us. I'm telling you, he has been a, gr a gracious host to us, and he and his wife. We appreciate it. Well, this song is called There's Power in Prayer. And I do want to say this. This, talk, this song talks about healing. And our son Sam was healed of that Tourette syndrome. I guess you could tell and when he was here he didn't have it. But after about three years of suffering with that, God just took it away. God healed him, and, and we prayed and prayed, and I know people were praying all over the country, and uh, thank God he can heal. You know, it's not always God's will to heal. Some of the charismatics will tell you, if you don't get healed, it's your fault. You don't have enough faith. And my friend, that is a devil's doctrine. It really is. Sometimes God has a purpose in an affliction that he can't accomplish any other way. But many times it is God's will to heal. I know he healed me, he healed my mother, and I've seen it, he healed our daughter of some thing. When the doctor said, we don't know what it is, the Lord knew what it was and he took it away. And so this is a song called, There's Power in Prayer. tonight for a loved one who's wandered away from the light prayer reaches heaven and god is aware and forever is changed in one moment of prayer A child's faith and it's goodbye to 
there's power, oh, there's power, so much power, there's power. The doctors have tried, but all hope seems in vain. But wait, someone's praying in the midst of the gloom. Amen. And all at once, the great physician steps into the room. A child's faith and it's goodbye despair. Oh, there's power, so much power. There's power in prayer. A few words, a child's faith and it's goodbye despair. Oh, there's power, so much power. There's power. Thank you so much. And these folks that have sang, sang this week, and then, of course, the preacher that has preached, all of them have such a sincere heart. And, of course, I know and love each one of them. Brother Steve such a humble uh, servant of the Lord and a good friend and a soul winner. And Brother John's kind and sincere. And uh, when I first met him, he was uh, as a youth pastor, and he helped in the youth group and helped. Uh, he's just a, a good friend for all these years. Then Brother Joe, not only to me personally, but then to our church and to this area, it's amazing how many people's lives have been touched in this whole region because of what God's used Brother Joe Arthur to do. And I know he gives the glory of the Lord, but I'm going to ask him to come preach to us and uh, give us what the Lord's led him tonight, and I'm looking forward to every bit of it. Thank, Thank you, you, my brother. brother. Yes, God sir. bless you tonight. John's Gospel, Chapter 6. And it's been a great thrill and a privilege to be back in the beautiful, wonderful, majestic, scenic Tri-Cities, Tennessee. And I've enjoyed being back at Buffalo Ridge. And good to see Brother Bob tonight. Appreciate him. And I love your pastor. And I thank the Lord for him. And I love this family. I tell you, Brother Epley, we've been blessed by your music down through the years. And you raised some wonderful children. And I know you give Mrs. Epley and God all the glory. And I thank the Lord for that. And I just... Thrills my heart. My, my dad had a lot of lost people in his family for a long time when he first got saved. And when daddy got saved, he got the Sunday morning kind, the Sunday night kind, you know, the Wednesday night kind, the visitation kind. You know, he just got church kind, you know, where you go all the time. And somebody told him, said, JB, if, if you don't watch out that little boy of yours, he goes to church so much. He'll never go to church when he's a grown man. I go every day. Some days I go twice a day. I preached for Sammy Allen one time, and we went all morning, all day, and half the night. Well, Billy Kelly got up. He said, bless God, enough's enough. I'm going home. Say amen right there. But the Lord is good, and I thank God for that. I've enjoyed being here, and I trust you've been blessed. And if you haven't, Blame it on somebody else. I'm having too good a time. The Lord is good. God is good to us. And there is power in prayer. I'm glad we have access to the throne of grace and an invitation to come boldly. And I'm glad the blood of Jesus gives us a new and living way. If you're saved tonight, raise your right hand. If you know it, raise your left hand. If you know you're right from your left, just say praise the Lord. Amen. Brother Epley, we love you. It's been a blessing. And smiling, John, it's good to see you again. I, I don't know how in the world anybody could get mad at John. Just smile at him and all that anger goes away. You ought to be a pastor. You could calm some people down. John chapter number 6 in your Bible tonight. And we'll break in the text in verse number 15. 
John chapter 6, verse number 15, And when Jesus therefore perceived that they would not come and take him by force to make him a, to make him a king, he departed again unto a mountain himself alone. And when even was now come, the, his disciples went down into the sea and entered into a ship and went over the sea toward Capernaum. And it was now dark. And Jesus was not come unto them. I want to add and say, not yet, but he's on the way and he'll be there and he'll be there on time and he'll know what to do when he gets there. And the Bible said in verse 18, and the sea arose by reason of a great wind that blew. So when they had rowed about uh, five and 20 or 30 furlongs, they see Jesus walking on the sea and drawing nigh unto the ship, and they were afraid. Verse 20, but he saith unto them, and I love these three little big words, and he said unto them, it is I. And then he followed it with three more little big words, be not afraid. I love verse 21. I see some humor in it. Then they willingly received him into the ship. I guess so. After all of that, they's probably glad to see him. <laughs> then they willingly received him into the ship and immediately the ship was at the land whether they went. And I'm interested tonight in that little phrase in the text where it said, and they see Jesus walking, not under the sea, not through the sea, not by the sea, but on the sea. The very thing they thought would be their demise and destruction. The very thing they thought would be the end of them. Jesus was on it. He was walking on what they thought would be their destruction. They found out that when the uncontrollable circumstances of life was out of their hand and over their head, it was always under the Savior's feet. Aren't you glad tonight that God is still in control? The world and the political leaders thinks they're in control. But I'm glad tonight the devil's not in control. I'm glad Obama is not in control and Biden's not in control and Trumpy boy is not in control. I, I'm glad the Pope's not in control. I'm so thankful my wife's mother is not in control. <laughs> and I'm not in control, but the Lord is still in control. Uh, like most of us in this building, with the exception of our friends from Oregon, most of us were born and raised in the South. And I'm not sure what language we speak, but it is a form of English. But us Southerners are notorious for just making up phrases and making up words. And I got to thinking the other day of some of the phrases I heard growing up. And I got curious and I looked them up and some of them were real words in the dictionary. For instance, anybody here ever heard the word traipse? Why that dude traipsed up in here like he owned the place. And did you know the word traipse is a real word? It's in the dictionary. It means to prance or to walk about. I wonder how many have been traiping today. Then here's another word my wife's mother's used through the years, one that I can actually use in church, praise God. And, and I want to ask you this. Anybody here ever heard this word, discombobulated? Now, if you've ever heard that word, raise your hand. Discombobulated. I really thought she made it up, but it is a real word. It's in the Merriam-Webster Dictionary. And Brother Epley, when I found the definition of the word discombobulated, man, that word fits our society. That word discombobulated means to be confused, to be bewildered. In other words, something's out of place, something's upside down. 
We had said it like this. Something ain't right about that. Discombobulated. And brother, we're living in a day when the world is discombobulated. Morally, politically, and even religiously. We're living in a world that's just upside down, bewildered, confused, something's not right. It's just discombobulated. In fact, I thought about preaching a message sometime on the discombobulation of society. And I guess when you get right with God, you get recombobulated. But brother, we're living in a world of bewilderment and confusion and discombobulated. But I believe when you come to John 6, you can put the word discombobulated on this text. Because these disciples are in this ship, not out of the will of God, but in the will of God. They're not in this ship in disobedience to the Lord. They're in this ship in obedience to the Lord. The Lord is the one that told them to get in the ship. The Lord is the one that told them to go to the other side. Brother Epley touched on this just a moment, so I must be on the right track. There's a lot of prosperity gospel going on across the television and the internet and the radio waves today by preachers, well, by so-called preachers that say if you're in the will of God and you're right with God, now you won't ever get sick, you won't ever have any problems, you won't ever have a headache. I thought, Lord, in the world, how's a man going to be married to a woman and never have any problems? Can I get an amen right there? And they'll tell you things like, if you're sick, you're out of the will of God. I asked a lady that believed that one time. I said, what do you mean by that? I said, uh, you know, uh, suppose you have a heart attack and die. She said, that's just heart failure. I said, the last time I looked that up, that's called a sickness. And brother, just because somebody is saved and in the will of God, that does not insulate nor isolate anyone from the storms and the trouble. I like to call it the uncontrollable circumstances of life. I've only lived 60 and a half years. But in the 60 and a half years I have lived, I have learned this. There are some things I don't have nothing to do with. There are some things I can't stop. There are some things I can't control. There are some things I can't change. Life is filled with uncontrollable circumstances. And it will bewilder you. It will confuse you. You will feel like you're discombobulated. But aren't you glad in the midst of their discombobulation, in the midst of their fear, in the midst of their trouble, when the uncontrollable circumstances of life is out of their hands and it's over their head, here comes Jesus walking on the water. He is not discombobulated. He is not bewildered. He is not confused. But he is in absolute control of the uncontrollable circumstances in your life and mine. And I'm glad tonight it's under the Savior's feet. I'm glad tonight that God is still on the throne. I'm glad he is still the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. I'm glad he is still the eternal, sovereign, faithful, righteous, holy God of the ages. And he is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And you may be in this room tonight feeling like your life, your family, your ministry, your world is discombobulated. It's out of your hand. It's over your head and you're filled with confusion. Why did this happen? Why did it have to happen here? And boy, the devil will tell you everything but the truth. But I've come to tell you tonight, standing somewhere in the shadows of your discombobulation is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And I'm glad when it's out of your hand and it's over your head, it's always under his feet. In our text tonight, according to these verses, there are three things that I want us to see. I want us to see, number one, the disciples. Then I want us to see the divine. And then I want us to see the destination. Now, when you look at the disciples, that's us. But when you see the divine, that's him. And praise God, when you reach the destination, that's it. And I'm glad one day it's going to be it. 
and we're going to a trouble where there'll be no more storms, there'll be no more uncontrollable circumstances. And I don't know about you tonight, but heaven is sounding sweeter all the time. I'm not singing, wait a little longer, please, Jesus. I'm hammering what John says, amen, even so come, Lord Jesus. Let's look in the text tonight and let's see the disciples. That's us. These disciples on this boat in the storm, it is a picture of you and I as we sail through these uncharted waters of life headed to the other side. Notice in our text tonight, three things the disciples had to deal with. First of all, in the text, I want you to see the darkness that they encountered. The darkness they encountered. Twice in our text, we are reminded that this storm, this uncontrollable circumstance, did not come upon them in the early morning. It did not come upon them in the middle of the afternoon. But the storm, this malady in their world came to them in the darkness. The Bible said it was even. The Bible said in the text it was now dark. And sometimes the storms and the troubles come in the dark places in our life. And by the way, it can be six o'clock in the morning and you can be in a dark place. You can be at 12 o'clock high noon and the sun is shining bright and still you're in a dark place. There are some dark times in all of our lives. And I mean, just in a moment, your world can be dark. One phone call can bring darkness into your life. One knock at the door can bring darkness into your life. One doctor's visit can bring darkness into your life. When the sun is not shining and the blessings are not flowing and you're in a world of darkness and you're wondering where is God in the midst of my confusion. But these disciples found out something that we're gonna find out. He is not only the God of the day, but he is the God of the night. He is not only with us when the sun is shining, but he is with us under the clouds of darkness. He is not only the God of the day, but he is the God of the night. And if you look in your Bible, some of the greatest things that God said and some of the greatest things that God did, he did it under the shroud of darkness. While it was dark that night when Abraham looked up at the stars and God said, I'm going to bless them. That I'm going to bless them. I'm going to bless them that bless you. It was at night when Jacob seen the vision and the ladder out of heaven down to the earth and the Lord standing at the top. It was a night season when Elijah had to go into that cave and he heard the still small voice of God. It was a night season when the Hebrew boys went to the fiery furnace and Daniel went to the lion's den. It was even a night season when Jesus Christ, the Son of God, came to this world. And the glory of the Lord lit up the night sky over the Judean hills and a silver star stuck its finger out of heaven over the manger and said, that is him. It was a dark night when Jesus drank the cup in the garden of Gethsemane. And it even got dark in the middle of the day at Calvary when Jesus died for our sins. And it was in the evening when they laid Jesus in the tomb of Joseph of Arimathea. But aren't you glad the Bible said in Psalm 30 in verse number 5, Though weeping may endure for a night, joy cometh in the morning. In a few moments, we'll dismiss this service and we'll have an intermission and we'll dismiss this service and you'll go outside and you'll look up and it'll be dark in Tri-Cities, Tennessee. But don't have a nervous breakdown. Don't give up. The sun is not extinguished. The sun is not going out of existence. The sun is still shining. You say, how come I can't see it? Because your world is turned upside down. But you give God 12 hours.
hours, he'll ride her right back side up again. And the sun's coming up in the morning. And brother, it may be a dark season in your life, your children, your family, your health, your job, your ministry. And you're wondering, where is God in the midst of my confusion? But I come to tell you tonight, standing somewhere in the shadows of your dark night, it's Jesus Christ, the rose of Sharon, the lily of the valley, the bride in the morning star, and the God, that's the God of the day. He is still the God of the night. I see the darkness that they encountered. Secondly, in the text tonight, I want you to see the distance they had traveled. The Bible said they had rode about 25 or 30 furlongs. The Bible said they're going from where Jesus performed the miracle on the mountain of the feeding of the 5,000 to the city of Capernaum. If you get out your Bible maps and see where Jesus fed the 5,000 to where the city of Capernaum was, they had to come down the mountain, go down into the sea, get in a little watercraft, and go up the coast of the lake. And to get from the top of the mountain where they started to the city limits of Capernaum where they were going was a distance of eight miles. Remember the number eight. They had eight miles to go. Well, the Bible said they had rowed about 25 or 30 furlongs. Get your Bible dictionary out. Figure how long a furlong is and do the math. And this is what you got. They had rowed approximately four to four and a half miles. Now, remember the number eight. If you've got eight miles to go, and you've only gone four, what does that tell you? That tells you that you're halfway there. That means that you're in the middle of your journey. That means you're in no man's land. You say, well, why do you say that? Well, think about it. When you're on a journey, and you've got eight miles to go, and you've only gone four, and you're stuck in the middle, that means you're cut off from the help that was behind you. You've not reached the help that's in front. You know what's bad about being caught in the middle? You know what's bad about being in a midlife crisis? You know what's bad about being stuck in the middle? It means this, you're not there yet, but it also means you're too far to turn back. And I want to tell you, a lot of people find themselves stuck in the middle. I mean, we're on our journey, but we're not there yet. And sometimes we feel like we're in no man's land. And I'm telling you, it's easy to quit when you're stuck in the middle. It's easy to give up at halftime. There's been a many athletic game lost or won at halftime. How you treat halftime determines the end of the game. If you're from Georgia or you know anything about Georgia athletics, we've been losers a long time. And I know I'm preaching to Tennessee, so you feel my pain. But I remember one year we finally met the Crimson Tide for the championship. And this ain't got nothing to do with religion, but I just want to say it. You don't know what a thrill it has been for this Georgia boy to go three years and not hear anybody say, Roll Tide. Isn't that music to our ears? But we got him in the championship. And son, we had, we had that Hertz boy on the ropes. We had Nick Saban in the phone booth calling for his mother. Them Georgia Bulldogs were running that ball down his throat. We are about to celebrate, but all of a sudden, halftime. Boy, if you are a Georgia fan, that word alone, halftime, brings fear and trembling to your heart. I don't know what Nick Saban said to them boys at halftime. I don't know if they got revival, saved, filled with the Holy Ghost. I don't know what happened. But I'll tell you what Nick Saban did. He did what nobody I know has ever done or had the guts to do. He got a second string quarterback on the other side of halftime in the biggest game of the year. And he goes to the second string quarterback.
He goes and gets a guy, Julio Homeo from Hawaii. And all of a sudden, here he comes. And before I know it, we done lost again. Somebody done called the dog catcher. And we done lost again. And the famous phrase was, wait till next year. Because, brother, we met somebody bigger than us at halftime. It was only about a year later, finally, finally, by a miracle of God, the Falcons made it to the Super Bowl. But we had to play pretty boy Tom Brady. And man, for that first half, we had old Tom Brady. I mean, we had him weeping. We had him crying. We had him about to give up. And I thought finally the, the Falcons are going to soar. And we're going to have something to be proud of. But then somebody called halftime. And I don't know what Tom Brady done at halftime. I don't know if he rededicated his life to God. I don't know what he did. But he come out on the other side of halftime. He run that ball down our throat. And the next thing I know, the dirty birds was in the cage. And we done lost again. And sure enough, there come that famous Falcons phrase, wait to next year. I found out you can lose at halftime, you can quit at halftime, you can give up at halftime, or you can regroup at halftime, revive at halftime, rejuvenate at halftime, and win on the other side of halftime. More than may be somebody in this room tonight, you feel like you're stuck in the middle. You've not reached it yet, but you're too far to turn back, and you feel like you're in no man's land. It feels like you can't go forward, and you look back, and you're far where you're come from and you feel like you're stuck in the middle and the devil's telling you to quit at halftime throw him the towel at halftime but I've come to tell somebody tonight halftime's not quitting time it's not throwing in the towel time it's not turning back time it's time to regroup it's time to revive it's time to regather and press on cause the trumpet will sound soon enough and the captain of our salvation will come and rescue us I'm telling Telling you tonight, if you've rode and tried and prayed and hoped and dreamed, and as far you as got and as far as you have gotten, it's half time. Here is my advice: lay down your oar, wait on Jesus. He'll come walking on the water and take you the rest of the way. Don't quit now. Don't give up now. Pray on. Trust on. God still answers prayer, and He's still real, even in the midst to the halftime of your life. And the darkness and the distance. Notice in the text tonight the despair that they felt. The Bible said in the midst of this darkness, in the midst of this fear, in the midst of the distance, the Bible said, and they were afraid. Mark chapter 4, the parallel reading of the passage says, and they were sore afraid. What they had seen frightened them. What they had heard frightened them. What they were experiencing, listen to this, their faith had given away to fear. And I know there are some people tonight, they'll say, I've never been afraid. I've never had anything to rattle my cage. I've never had anything to really set me back. Oh, let me tell you, life is full of fearful things. One phone call, one doctor's visit, and all of a sudden you are afraid. I have been afraid in my life. I'm sorry to admit that, but sometimes our faith gives way to fear. The fear of the circumstances. The fear of the unknown. The fear of what you can't control. The fear of what you cannot change. One of your children comes in and flings themselves in your arms and says, Daddy, fix this. 
and it's bigger than daddy can fix you will fear I mean there'll be times in your ministry when you no matter what decision you make you're not going to win you, this is an unwinnable situation and you get afraid and boy you sit in that doctor's office and he throws that cancer word and he throws that heart disease word and he throws that dementia word and he throws all of these words and buddy you get afraid what you can't see what you can't change it's out of your hand it's over your head and you find out you're just at the mercy of the sea but I've come to tell somebody tonight in great Tennessee you'll never be at the mercy of the sea you'll never be at the mercy of the storm you'll never be at the mercy of the circumstances because my God I feel like preaching right there because standing somewhere in the shadows of your world that's turned upside down will be the living Christ the mercy the grace and the love of almighty God and he will say to you and I be not afraid I've come to tell you when it's out of your hand and over your head and you can't do anything about it our God is still in control of the circumstances of life and so I see the disciples that's us but I don't want to overemphasize the problem. I want to really emphasize the solution. So we see the disciples, that's us. But notice the next verse in the text. I see the divine, and that's him. Yes, I see the divine, that's him. Jesus, well, glory. Jesus, I just love it when I mention his name. Jesus shows up in the midst of their discombobulation. And I love the way the Holy Spirit, and by the way, man, I love my King James. And it's not only true, it's not only accurate, it's not only right, it's not only eternal, but it's beautiful. And notice how beautiful it is. It says in the text, and they see Jesus. And they see Jesus. Here's a good southern word. Right smack dab. That's in the dictionary right beside a discombobulation. Right smack dab in the middle of their fear, their despair, their darkness, their trouble. And they see Jesus. You know what they had seen up to this point? Nothing but fear and anxiety. All they had seen up to this point is the fear and the failure in one another's eyes. But all of a sudden now, Pastor, they're looking above the wind. They're looking above the waves. And most of all, they're looking above themselves. And they see Jesus. I've got wrote down in my Bible, holler glory right here. Glory right here. And they see Jesus. You said, now, Brother Joe, I, I believe we got a contradiction. There are none of those in the Bible. One guy said, well, they're in there. I said, show me one. He said, well, they're in there. I said, show me one. He said, there are many. I said, I don't need any. I just want to see one. He found out there ain't none in there. But Brother Joe, you just said a while ago it was dark. It was, and I did. Brother Joe, you said a while ago that it was uncontrollable and they didn't know where they were. That's right. I did, and that's right. But Brother Joe, now you're saying they see Jesus. They did. But, but, but Brother Joe, how do you see somebody when it's dark? How do you see somebody in the midst of the darkness? Well, I'm glad you brought that up. I got four answers. Are you ready? Number one, when you're the light of the world, you stand out. Number two, when you're the bright and the morning star, you stand out. Number three, when you're the day star that arises in your heart, you stand out. And number four, when you're the son of righteousness that's going to arise with healing in his wings, you're going to stand out. 
Buddy, I don't care how dark it is. When the sun comes up, you're going to see it. It was dark that night, but the sun, not the S-U-N, but the S-O-N, stepped out in the middle of their darkness. And when they couldn't see the hand in front of them, when they couldn't see anything else, they see Jesus. And all of a sudden, they're not looking at the circumstances. They're not looking at the storm. They're not looking at themselves or the helplessness of the brethren. They've got a glimpse of him who's in the victory circle. Aren't you glad tonight in the midst of a world of confusion? We can see him. And they see Jesus. Two things in the text tonight about Jesus. Notice, I love what he's doing. I love the way he's walking. The Bible said in the text, and they see Jesus walking not by the sea, not under the sea, but on the sea. Now, I know I got this Pentecostal microphone, and I don't want to sound like one of them Pentecostal preachers, but I do want to tell you, there is victory in Jesus Christ. Oh, Romans chapter 8 said we're more than conquerors. And I want to tell you about Jesus tonight. He's on your pain. He's on your problem. He's on your fear. I may get under the circumstances, but when I'm under the circumstances, praise God, he's on it. Walking on the sea. Now watch your Bible. He's not out there just walking around. He's headed somewhere. The Bible said, and they see Jesus walking on the sea. And watch this phrase. Drawing nigh. Say that with me. Drawing nigh. Well, I like that. Say that again. Drawing nigh unto the ship. I love the word draw in the Bible. The word, the word draw or draw is all in the scripture. By the way, you know what the word draw means? It means to be induced. It means to be overwhelmed. It means to be pulled in a direction by a powerful force. And by the way, when the draw in the Bible, 99% of the draw in the Bible is a sovereign God drawing a depraved sinner to himself. Let me ask you this. Does anybody in this tabernacle remember when you got induced? When you got drawn whew, whoop, by the power of the Holy Spirit. Let me ask you this. Anybody here went to church before you got saved just to shut somebody up? I mean, they kept inviting you. Come on to church. Come. And you said, all right, I'll go to shut them up. But when I go, I'm not going to pay attention. I'm not going to listen. I'm, gonna put, I'm not going to get my mind on it. And I'm definitely not going to get down there and wall around like them holler rollers. As soon as it's over, I'm out of there, going to smoke me a cigarette, and I'm going to go home and forget it. And there you came. You weren't looking for God. You weren't interested in God. And becoming a Christian was the farthest thing for your mind. But while you were sitting there trying to daydream, you got induced. God got a hold of you. God drew you by the power of the Holy Spirit. And not only did you stay for the whole thing, not only did you listen to every word, you got up and went down there and wandered around like them holy rollers. God saved you because you got drawn, you got induced, you got interested. But aren't you glad God is able to draw sinners? He said, if I be lifted up, I'll draw men unto me. I thank God tonight for the drawing of God. I'm glad God draws us to him through the preaching of the gospel and the power of the Holy Spirit. But watch your Bible, watch your Bible in this text. This overwhelms me, Brother Epley. Now in this text, the drawing, being induced, being pulled by a force. Look who's being drawn in this text. Look who in this text is drawn and induced and who has a desire to go somewhere. Now the Lord's induced. Now the Savior is induced. Now the Savior is being drawn and pulled by a force. I want to ask you this tonight. 
What in the world could induce the sovereign God of eternity to come to you and I when we need him the most? I see the magnetism in this text as Jesus is drawing nine of that ship. What in the world about that ship could induce the Savior and, and draw him? Well, I'll tell you this, it wasn't the stern. It wasn't the bow. It wasn't the wheel. It wasn't the anchor. It wasn't the sail. It wasn't the rudder. I'll tell you what it was. It was them souls, them people, them disciples on that ship is drawing the Lord. You see, he had created them. He had converted them. He had called them. And in the next book, he's going to take them to Pentecost to the upper room and fill them with the power of God. And they're going to leave that upper room and they're going to turn the world upside down. And we're going to have church and Grace Station, Tennessee, 2000 and years later because what God did with them men in that upper room. You see them boys on that boat? God's got big plans for them. Them boys on that boat, God has their best interest in mind. Those men on that boat, God knows what's in store for them and he's not about to let them drown in that sea till his purpose is completed into their life. Can I remind myself tonight in the midst of a world of hurt and pain. Can I just remind myself tonight that Romans 8, 28 is still in the Bible that not some things and not a few things and not several things but that all things work together for good to them that love God and here's the kicker and to them who are the called according to his purpose. Our God have mercy. He has a plan for your life. He has a purpose for your life. He has your best interest in mind. He knows where he's going to take you and God's going to keep you safe. God's going to keep you saved. God's going to keep you sound until his purpose is fulfilled in your life. And the, Can I just be real plain? And the devil can't do nothing about it. Hallelujah. And he's going to them boys. He's got them. He's drawing nigh to that ship. I feel good. I'm about to pull a James Brown. I feel good. Hey, Whew. I know you're too spiritual for that, but I feel good. He's drawing nigh to that ship. And Pastor John, can I just say this tonight? What a thrice holy, omnipotent, sovereign, faithful Savior makes up his mind. He's going somewhere. Look out. Hang on. He'll be there. I see Jesus as he's drawing nigh to that ship. You say, well, maybe somebody could stop him. Really? When God makes up his mind, he's going somewhere. He cannot be stopped. You say, I believe he can be stopped. All right, let's deduce this just a minute. What are you going to stop him with? You can't use water. He'll walk on it. You can't use fire, he'll refuse to burn and walk around in it. You can't use a line, he'll lock his jaw. You can't get him on the side of a mountain with a fiery furnace because he'll hold you in the palm of his hand. Uh, you can't slam the door on him or build a wall around him because he'll shout the wall down and walk through the door and won't even ring the bell. Uh, you, you can't nail him to a cross cause he a bleed on it and render it powerless. We about to have church in here now. And you can't seal him in a grave because in three days he'll kick the lid off and come out on the other side and say, I was dead but I'm alive forevermore. And you can't sick the devil on him because he'll stomp on him and whip him and beat him. He already did it at Calvary. I want to tell you when God makes up his mind, he's going to bless you. He's going to deliver you. He's going to help you. Nothing can stop the Lord. I'm glad he's the peace speaker. He's the way walker. He's the nerve calmer. He's the problem solver. He's the death will defeater. He's the grave robber. <laughs> Whew, I'm about to get blessed. I'm glad when when God makes up his mind, he's a coming, he'll be there. 
and I see the way that he's walking. But oh, in the text, I see the way he's a talking. He's not only walking on the water, drying, drawing nigh unto them, he's a talking to them at the same time. And I love what he says. I mean, it's dark, lightning, wind, waves, rain, uncontrollable circumstances, and he just walks on it, and he says, it is I, be not afraid. It is I, be not afraid. You say, Brother Joe, there's no one in contradictions. I done told you there ain't none of them in there. But, but Brother Joe, you said he shines in the darkness. You said there's no darkness that can put out the light. I'm glad you were listening. But Brother Joe, you said it was a storm. Lightning, wind, and waves beating against that ship. It's a noisy scene. They surely didn't hear him. I'm glad you brought that up. Just as sure as there's no darkness that can put out his light, there is no disturbance that can silence his voice. Brother, we're living in a world where the enemy and the weirdos and the crackpots have filled this world with bad news and bad news. But I'm glad above the strife, above the profundity of the... Oh, don't get me started. I'm glad louder than the threats of the enemy is another voice. It's a powerful voice that cannot be drowned by the politicians and the fake religious leaders of this world. Hey, man, there is a voice that sounds louder than the trumpet giving an uncertain sound. And it's the voice of our God, our rock, our refuge. Hey, man, our redeemer. And that voice is louder than the circumstances. And it says, it is I, it is I, it is I be not afraid. And I'm glad the Bible said in John 10, his sheep hear his voice and they know him. Does anybody here know where Meadowview, Virginia is? Bristol is a suburb of Meadowview. There's a preacher over there in Meadowview, Virginia that pastors a little church and, and he's bivocational. You say, what's a bivocational preacher? He preaches for free and works to feed his family. And his bivocation, his vocation is he's a real shepherd. He has about three or four hundred sheep at his mama's house in that big old pasture. Real sheep. He's a real shepherd. And boy, one night he said, now, Brother Joe, Friday night, we're going to eat at Big Mama's house. And if you're from the South, when you say Big Mama, that, that don't have anything to do with size. That means she's just Grandmama. When we were having our grandchildren, my children said, what do you want us to have them call you? I said, man, I like Big Daddy. Call me Big Daddy. And my wife said, nope. They ain't calling me Big Mama. He said, we're going to Big Mama's house. And I knew what that meant. Fried chicken. I think it ought to be a sin to do anything to a chicken but fry it. I mean that kind when you hold it up. It runs and drips off of your elbows. Real cream potatoes, not them little dandruff flakes with water in it. I mean the kinds that's got lump in it. And if you eat enough of them, it'll put a lump on you. <laughs> You've had some, haven't you? <laughs> We're going to Big Mama's. So we went, man, listen, real nanner pudding. You said, did you mean, but no, nanner with Neller wafers in it. My friends from Oregon, vanilla, nanner. Y'all do go to Pals, don't you? Praise God, hallelujah. I've preached in Oregon, and I'm telling you, there ain't no Pals hot dogs out there. After we ate a big old meal, Brother John, he said, come on, Brother Joe, let's walk around. I thought, that might be a good idea. And so we got out there in the backyard. I'm telling you, over 400 head of sheep. He's, and he, he had these little wooden troughs up there called watering trough. I've never seen anything like it. He said, Brother Joe, he said, uh, won't you call the sheep down here to the watering troughs? I said, do what? He said, won't you call the sheep down here to the watering troughs? I said, okay. 
I mean, I, I didn't know what to say. I mean, I, I knew if you wanted a dog, you'd say doggy doggy. If you wanted a cat, you'd say kitty kitty. So I jumped up on the fence and said sheepy sheepy. I didn't know what to say. Man, I hollered, I yelled, I made all kind of vocal inflections. And those sheep never one time ever looked my way. Preacher John Serber said, watch this, boy. He put his hand over his mouth, made some kind of sound. And every sheep in that pasture came at a dead run when he called. And I looked at him, and he saw the puzzled look, and I said, how did you do that? And boy, I shouted right there. I couldn't hardly breathe from all that nine or pudding, but I shouted right there. He said, Brother Joe, they know me, and I know them. And Brother Epley, when he said this, I wanted to climb a wall backwards. He said, I was there when most of them were born. He said, they felt my touch, they know my smell. And they, shoo. He said, I'm not a stranger to them. He said, you are a stranger to them. I'm not a stranger. I want to tell you, ladies and gentlemen, when the world cries, you graze on. When sin cries, you graze on. When the devil haunts you, you graze on. But I'm glad there's another voice that overcomes the world and a voice that shatters the darkness and dispels the fear. It's the voice of our Savior, the Rose of Sharon, the Lily of the Valley, and the Bright in the Morning Star. And he said, says in the midst of the worst time of your life it is I it is I it is I be not afraid and thank God I'm glad he walks with me and he talks with me and he tells me I'm his own I love it when my mama would say baby everything's gonna be all right I used to love it when my three big nosy sisters would say Everything's going to be all right. My daddy wouldn't say it quite compassionately. He'd say, you'll be all right. And I love it when my, three, my two children say, it's going to be all right. I love it when the church I pastored almost 40 years says, preacher, it's going to be all right. Boy, I wish Julie, my wife, would just tell me one time. She says something like this, suck it up, be a man, pay your dues, put on your big boar breeches and deal with it. <laughs> and then I say, get behind me, Satan. <laughs> Don't do that. <laughs> I married one of them girls from Wilkes County, North Carolina. They fight. <laughs> Don't you love it when one of your friends will say to be all right? I've got friends I call when I'm perplexed, when I'm in trouble. A lot of my good old buddies has passed away that I talk to nearly every day of my, of my ministry. And I got a few left I can call and bear my heart with and they'll say, preacher boy, it's gonna be all right. But I'm going to tell you tonight, church, can't nobody say it like Jesus. Can't nobody say it like Jesus. You know why? Because he's the only one that can make it all right. I see the disciples, that's us. I see the divine, that's him. But during our intermission, number three, lastly, I want you to see the destination. Now remember, when you see the disciples, that's us. When you see the divine, that's him. But when you reach the destination, that's it. Notice how the last verse in the text says. It says, and when they willingly received him into the ship, verse 21, it says, immediately. Does that say that in your Bible? Immediately the ship was at the land where they went. Well, glory goes right there. They had told all night and it only gone four miles. They had four more miles to go. But when Jesus stepped on board, they were there. That's in the Bible. I didn't get this off of sermonaudio.com. 
This is not a Joe Arthur or a Mays Jackson. This is not even a David Gibbs story. This really happened. I love you, David. Immediately. Does anybody here know the definition of the word immediately? It means right now. You spell that R-A-T-N-O-W, right now. You know what immediately really means? How many got your snapper with you tonight? You got your snapper with you tonight? All right. And all of God's people said? Let's do that again. And all of God's people said? Oh, yes. I mean, they got eight miles to go. They'd only gone four. It took them all night. They've got four more to go, and it looks like they'll never get there. But when Jesus stepped on the ship, it was done. By the way, you know how long it takes God to save a sinner? You know how long it takes God to solve your problem? And all of God's people said, not amen. And all of God's people said, you know when the Lord Jesus is coming back? In the moment, in the twinkling of an eye, you say, how fast is that? And all of God's people said, I mean, here they are. They start out in the morning, and they're rowing, and they row through the midday, and they row through the evening, and in the midst of the darkness, they're stuck in the middle, and they've got as far to go as they had when they started, and it feels like they'll never get there. But then all of a sudden, walking on the water, saying, peace be still, is our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And just like Immediately, just like they were there. I'm telling you, I ain't making that up. You say, explain it. I tell you what to do. I'll explain that one. You'll explain this. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And God said, let there be light. And and God said, let the dry land appear. Amen. Lazarus, come forth. The devil, go home. Peace be still. Woo! Aren't you glad, ladies and gentlemen, when Jesus steps on board, what seems like is forever. The storm is forever. The valley is forever. The problem is forever. The pain is deep and it hurts and it seems like it's forever. But just like that, God answers prayer, changes the scene, turns things around, and you are reminded what it takes a lifetime to fight just like that. You ready? We're out of here. The destination. In our text, the destination was reached and the destination was realized. You say, Brother Joe, who made it? Are you ready? All of them. Well, who made it? Everyone that was on board. Well, how many got off? Everyone that got on. And I believe... When they reached the destination, can I cancel that intermission? I feel like preaching right here. When they reached the destination, immediately, and all of God's people said, I believe they looked back and went, wow. They might have said, well, that wasn't long at all. Well, that wasn't too far. That wasn't all that bad. Well, how many times has God brought us through? And we look back and say, I worried about that. That kept me up late at night. That caused me to have faith instead of fear. My wife was... Delivering our first child, my son that was here the other night, Bubba. 
All rednecks have a Bubba in the family. City people have them too, but they call them Bubbettes. Can I get an amen right there? And I mean, she was struggling. Finally, that little thing is born. And I lay him up on her chest. And what she, she said, oh no, he looks like Billy Kelly. I said, well, he's ours and we got to keep him and we can't take him back. And I remember her hugging little Bubba. And she said this, Brother Epley. She said, the pain's gone. It was worth it all. God's give us our firstborn son. It was worth it all. She said, I'm so glad we did this. I'm thinking, well, it's too late to do anything about it now. But she just said, ain't it wonderful? Ain't it wonderful? Ain't it wonderful? She said, it's been worth it all. And I want to tell you sometimes, buddy, we go through the hard storms. And I don't want your sympathy. And I don't want to share too much. But June of 2019 on a Thursday night at 1030, I, my family, my ministry, a church, walked into a storm, walked into a hard place, and not walked out of it. And it seems like every time you think you got some relief, here we go again. And the storms and the pressures and the disappointments. And then, you know, you think you're going to get a breath, and here comes COVID. Here comes COVID. You think you're going to have a thousand on Easter Sunday. You have two or three. And I don't know, you may have enjoyed them parking lot services. You know, toot if you love Jesus. I didn't like nothing about that. Because people came to hear me preach and ate McDonald's and the Nuggets and the French fries. And y'all probably ate a few pals hot dogs while you was out there too. And then you get to going a little bit and then you got this problem and you got that problem. And then you go to the doctor and he tells you you may have throat cancer. You go to the doctor and he tells you we found something in your lungs. And you go to the doctor and he tells you you got something in your heart, your widowmaker. And then your wife, they find something. And then this, and then this, and then that. And if you're not careful, you'll look up and say, oh God, where are you? What's going on in my world? Lord, I can't change this. I can't stop this. I can't fix this. And then I hear that voice over the thunder, over the lightning, over the wind, over the circumstances that are out of my hands and over my head. And before you know it, and all of God's people said, God's got it. And the peace of God that passeth all understanding rules and umpires your heart. As we stand together tonight, Will you come back and do that song you did again last night about God being faithful? I sung out all night. About half, in fact, about three o'clock this morning, I had me a spell. I was expecting them to call any moment from down there at the desk saying, is there a wild party going on in that room? Yeah, it was me and the big three having us a time. Woo! But as we close this service tonight, I want you to look at your text real quick. You know the difference between success and failure in this passage? One phrase, and they willingly received him into the ship. Pastor, if they'd have kept the Lord at arm's bay, if they'd have said, Jesus, we got it on our own, we'll take care of it, we don't need you, it wouldn't have ended this way. But the reason why God stepped on the scene and all of God's people said, Because they willingly, they willingly said, Jesus, this is bigger than us. We can't handle it. Welcome aboard. And until you willingly turn the keys of your life over to the sovereign providential God of heaven, you're not going to sail. But as soon as you let go of it and give it to Jesus, God will handle your storm. Our Heavenly Father, we love you tonight. We thank you for this evening. Thank you for the songs of Zion. Thank you for the truth of the Word of God. I pray, Lord, that you bless your people tonight. Bless my wife tonight. Bless our family. Bless our church people going through the dark storms. 
I'm glad, Lord, when you come on board and speak peace. May someone in this room tonight take their fear, take their uncontrollable circumstances and just give it to you because you're faithful. You always have been and you always will be. In the mighty name of Jesus, while she sings tonight, people are coming, why don't you join us and just do like these disciples did and willingly open the door of your home, morning by your health, morning, your children, I wake up your family, to find the that which you can't stop and start and change, and comfort willingly, God's hand in mine, willingly, season by season, willingly receive him, I to the watch show. him amazed, Lord, this is too big for me, but it's not too big for you. Give him your pain. Give him your trouble. Give him your bewilderment. Give him your confusion. Give him your discouragement, your anxiety, your fear. Give it to him. He's always been faithful. He cares. To me. He's aware. And they willingly received him into the shield. I can't remember a trial or Hallelujah. a pain. You never will. He did not recycle to bring me gain. I can't remember no, no. one single regret. No regrets. In serving God only and trusting His hand. All, All I I've have needed, need of, God's hand. His hand will provide. He's always been faithful to me. Great is thy faithfulness. This is my song, the theme of the stories I've heard for so long. God has been faithful, he will be again. His loving compassion, it knows no end. All I have need of, his hand will provide. He's always been faithful to me. Well, what a great time to be in the house of the Lord and just to hear it given to you straight and full barrel and just right at you. And uh, what a wonderful, wonderful time just to be in God's house. And, and Brother Joe doesn't know what any of you are going through unless you've mentioned to him just in passing for a prayer request in the last couple of days. But the Lord's the, the, the Lord's people, rather, are going through a lot of things right now. Many of you right now. And thank you, Brother Joe, for reminding them, reminding us that God's got things in control. He's always been faithful. He really has. Would you let her sing it one more time? Would you just mind sitting there for just a moment and let the Lord settle in on you? Because the future probably is not going to be much different than the past. The only difference is going to be if we look to the Lord through what comes. 
And so she sings. Would you just let God minister to you? Morning by morning, I wake up to find the power and comfort of God's hand in mine. Season by season, I watch him amazed in awe of the mystery of his perfect ways. All I have need of, his hand will provide. He's always been faithful to me. I can't remember a trial or a pain he did not recycle to bring me gain. I can't remember one single regret in serving God only and trusting his hand. All I have need of, his hand will provide. He's always been faithful to me. Praise the Lord. I know that there's a few young folks that are thinking, well, I haven't had anything yet. But some of you older folks, it does, you realize it doesn't take long to figure out that there's more going on in this life than you can handle. And we need somebody outside of ourselves to give us continuity and give us stability to make it through. Thank you, Brother Joe. Thank you, Miss Epley. And um, thank you, thank you for being here tonight. I know it's later than, uh, than it normally is, but how could we stop when the Lord was doing such a great work? Thank you, Brother Joe. Thank you for minding the Lord. And uh, thank you, Brother Epley, Miss Epley, and Brother John. Thank you for being here with us, our wonderful guests, all week or those three days. And so I trust that um, you'll... See, as you leave, there's uh, ushers back there with uh, offering plates. This is just to offset some of the cost of the revival. And uh, we want to take care of God's man as he came in. We want to take care of the, uh, the, men of the men and ladies of God that came and sang for us and was a blessing. And so we'll uh, write those checks and take care of them because we, we don't believe in bringing somebody in if we can't take care of them. If you'd like to help offset that, you can put it in the offering plate. Uh, also, if you want to give to the Epleys, they've got some CDs back there. And uh, they're for a love offering basis. And some of you, I think, just gave off love offering and no uh, CD, which is great too, because these are worthy recipients of, of your dollars because they're using it for the Lord's work. So thank you so much. Well, I'm going to ask you to uh, stand together with us, Brother Steve and Miss Benita, if you don't mind to uh, slip out to the table back there. Brother Joe will be up this way to kind of, you go back there too? Yeah. You want him to stand with you, Brother Steve? Is that all right? 
He's not going to hurt your feelings. He won't hurt you. Okay. All right. Well, they'll be back there, and you, you let them know that you appreciate them. Let them know that it's a blessing to have at Buffalo Ridge Baptist Church. We'll look forward to the next time we can have them back. Thank you for being here. God bless you. You're dismissed.